Hello, and welcome to another episode of Suspension Simplified by MTB Dev. Today, we're going to talk about displacement compensation. Displacement compensation is used to adjust the volume of the damper chamber as the volume requirements change. Now, the volume requirements are dictated by uh, the amount of damper shaft that's inside of the body. So as the damper shaft moves in and out of the body, that's going to change. It's also dictated by heat, as well as ingestion. Certain dampers may pull oil in from the containing chamber and bring that up into the damper body, and that's going to slowly increase over time. So you need a way to keep uh, the damper oil uh, chamber the correct size at all times throughout operation. Now, one simple way to do this is to just leave the top of the uh, damper open to air, and that air can expand and compress to fill the void. But as we talked about in the damper types video, that's going to allow for aeration, which changes the performance significantly. It also doesn't put any pressure on the oil, and the pressure is what keeps the oil flowing back and forth through the piston and port orifices to reduce the risk of cavitation during operation. So in order to have a sealed system, you're going to need some type of dynamic displacement compensation that can change as the system requirements change. For this, the most common types of displacement compensation are an IFP, or internal floating piston, and a bladder. Now, with the IFP system, you use a small disc that's sealed against the sides of the uh, piston body or the damper body and is allowed to move up and down freely as the volume changes in the uh, damper body. Now, uh, these are fairly robust, uh, but they do have a few downsides. If uh, if they're improperly engineered, built, or lubricated, they can walk or move back and forth during operation, and that allows the uh, high pressure uh, gas backing to creep by and enter the damper fluid, causing aeration. Another th downside is that they increase the seal surface area in the system, which increases the total system friction and reduces your small bump sensitivity. So to reduce that, you can use a bladder back system. Uh, that's going to have, uh, in a shock, it's going to use a bulbous uh, style bladder. Now, sometimes that's uh, a system that's filled with nitrogen and pushing into the oil, and sometimes it's filled with oil and pushing into the nitrogen. Um, but these are going to be far more sensitive, uh, better at uh, direction reversals, but they do tend to fatigue and develop either cracks or little pinholes that are going to allow that high pressure backing to push its way into the oil and again aerate it. Now, moving on to a fork, we're going to have the same two basic systems, but they're going to be slightly different in how they're executed. The IFP can be backed by a coil spring instead of a high pressure uh, gas charge if you want. Um, and that's going to reduce the compression ratio. Now with a shock, as this compresses, as the IFP moves into that compressed gas chamber, it's going to contribute to the overall progressivity of the shock because it's ramping up here as well. In a fork, you can use a spring, which reduces the progressive component and gives you a more linear feel throughout uh, the system. In a bladder-backed system on a fork, you're generally going to have a sleeve-type bladder that's expanding out and then contracting back in, rather than a bulb-style bladder, and uh, that is not going to be backed by anything. There's not going to be any... Uh, nitrogen, compressed gas, or uh, spring backing that. So that's just going to uh, extend and compress on its own, under its own tension. Um, now with that, that does reduce the preload on the oil, the, the system pressure on the oil, which can increase the 
risk of cavitation if there's a large fast input. However, these are much less likely on a fork, not only because you have less weight up there, but because there's no mechanical advantage in a fork. Uh, telescoping forks are a one-to-one -one system, so the movement, the input, is going to move uh, the wheel one inch and the damper piston one inch, uh, whereas on a shock, you have some sort of linkage on almost every system, and that's going to multiply the force. So if you uh, move three inches on the back, you might only move two and a half inches on the shock, and that's going to change uh, the amount of force pretty significantly on a shock. Now, another contributing factor in displacement compensation is the size of the damper shaft. The uh, larger the diameter of the shaft, the more it's going to displace as it moves into that body of oil. So here we have a larger damper shaft. It's going to need to move this IFP chamber pretty far in order to compensate for uh, the volume that it displaces, whereas right here we have a narrower damper shaft uh, that's going to uh, displace less oil and require the displacement compensator to move less, as well as reducing the seal surface area down here, which is going to make it more sensitive. So overall, uh, a narrower damper shaft is going to be better for performance, although it may not be the best choice as far as robustness and build quality. Worth noting are the Trek through shaft shock and Manitou's soft IFP. Through shaft shocks have been common in motorcycle sports for years, but Trek just recently brought them to the bicycle industry. What they do is use a damper shaft that goes through the entire damper body. Thus, as the piston moves up and down through the body, the damper shaft volume doesn't change, and therefore you don't need to compensate for that. However, the shocks still experience thermal expansion, so you do still need a small IFP. In this case, Trek calls them the thermal compensator, and on this generation, they're mounting them outside strictly to make them look cooler. Uh, they do work just as well mounted inside, which is what they had on prior generations. Now, uh, this does account for the largest type of uh, displacement in a damper, and so by alleviating that, you do reduce the breakaway force needed. However, you introduce an additional seal surface, and that not only increases system friction, it also increases, the, introduces a new point of failure. And because you're not actually eliminating the IFP, this system is more complex without having significant advantages. Now, Manitou just introduced their soft IFP. This is pretty interesting. It actually uses, instead of a hard puck IFP that has to move up and down every time there's displacement inside the damper, it uses a soft face on the IFP that can distend and uh, expand a little bit on its own. So if there's small chattery stuff and the direction of the damper shaft is reversing very quickly, it can account for that without actually having to break away the seal on the sides of the damper body. Lastly, reservoirs on a shock, or the piggyback, aren't necessary for IFPs or bladders, but they always house them. So uh, the reason to have an I or a reservoir is to increase the oil volume for the shock size. And that gives you better thermal capacity. The oil can take more heat, which is what the damper is doing. It's taking energy and transforming it into heat. Uh, and because there's more oil, you can have more heat in that system before the characteristics start to change significantly. Uh, reservoirs can house either the, an IFP style or a bladder style. Uh, and they're going to push the oil through a bridge right here. Now, this is a great opportunity for what's called base valving. You have valves on your piston, but right here at this bridge, you can have additional valving because there's oil flowing back and forth. We'll touch more on that later as we delve deeper into dampers over the next few episodes.
If you do have specific questions about dampers, we'd love to hear about those in the comments, so please post those below and we'll try to do our best to address those in a future episode. Thanks for watching and have a great day.